Good afternoon, uh, good evening, or um, good morning, uh, wherever you are. And uh, thank you for joining today's event with, to discuss uh, last week's trade show, TCT Asia in Shanghai. Uh, I'm Michael Petch, I'm your host, and I'm the uh, Editor-in-Chief of 3D Printing Industry Magazine, a uh, trusted news source for the additive manufacturing community. Um, this is the second um, debrief on a trade show we've done recently. We did a, a debrief on the AMO conference um, a few weeks back. And so it's great to see face-to-face um, -face events returning. Obviously, not everybody is able to travel at the moment. So what used to be a great international community now has become um, slightly more regional. So that's the, um, the idea behind doing these debriefs, uh, giving an opportunity for everybody who would have liked to attend the show, um, but unfortunately was unable to travel just to unpick some of the news, the announcements and get a bit of an insight into, uh, into what sort of took place. Um, so I see we've got um, guests from around the world and around the industry as, um, as is uh, expected. And uh, it's always good to see familiar names um, and sort of turning up. Now, if you're not familiar with Remo, I'll do a very brief bit of admin. Um, as uh, I can see some of you have found, the chat function is on the uh, right-hand side of the screen. Um, if you'd like to introduce yourself, say hello to um, your colleagues, friends, uh, contacts, um, then please uh, please do use that. Um, we also, on the right-hand side of the screen, there is a box for Q&A. Now, in the Q&A, um, that's where you can ask questions of today's panelists and um, people can actually um, vote up the questions that they want to ask. Now, the purpose of doing this as a live event, obviously, is to make it interactive. Now, with that in mind, I will be taking questions um, as frequently as possible from the Q&A. So please, if you'd like to know anything at all from our panelists, uh, we'll do our best to answer your questions. Uh, so please don't hesitate to ask or using that Q&A function. Um, the only final point I'd like to make is this will be um, this part of the conversation where we present and we have a panel discussion that this will be in this particular mode. Once we've completed that, there will be a networking session afterwards and you'll be returned back to the uh, networking area. To navigate around that space, you can just double click on the tables and you'll be taken to, um, to a table to just talk about uh, today's show or talk about additive manufacturing in general. Um, and then, without further ado, then in that case, I'd like to invite our guests for today um, to please turn on your cameras. Fantastic, excellent. So it's great, to, uh, great to see everybody. I'm joining from uh, across the globe, but um, I know um, I'm in London, um, but. Uh, Jingyi, you're in, um, where are you? You're in Munich today, is that right? Yes, I'm in Munich. Hello from Munich. And uh, what, what do you do in Munich? You work for Dimension, don't you? Pardon? You work for Dimension. Yes, yes, yes. And um, shall I have a short intro about myself yes, and yes, please. company? Yeah. Hi. Hello, everybody. I'm Jingyi. I'm Director of Region APEC at Dimension. For people who uh, do not know Dimension, Dimension is the world's leader in additive manufacturing finishing systems that turn 3D printed raw parts into high value products. From perfect fit eyewear to uh, personalized eye car interiors, our technology makes 3D printed products become part of our everyday life. We started in year 2015 with the first industrial coloring solution for SLS parts. This white dye, dimension, dye house, coloring house. And we shortly extended our portfolio with advanced part cleaning and servicing solutions for a wide range of 3D printing technologies in the fields of plastics, with focus for SLS, MJF, and recently for SF from uh, Stratasys. And our 
print to product workflow combines industry leading hardware with the widest range of color options on the market. That's why Dai mentioned that's all from my yeah. side. And uh, I, I thought the 3D printing industry, I mentioned very well, and I'm sure anyone who's been to the first night of Form Next probably knows why. <laughs> the party. <laughs> oh, yes, the party. Yes. Yeah. Um, Mark, um, I'd like to sort of introduce you. If you maybe could tell us a bit about yourself and um, about Pure for those who don't know. Hi, I'm Mark Penn from Pure Poly. Um, I'm uh, one of the uh, co-founders of the team. Uh, we started the team uh, back in 2016, and we focus on large format uh, MSLA resin printing. Um, our uh, flagship printer is called Fina, and we have been selling that to 20 resellers uh, around the globe since uh, 2019. Um, and my, you know, my specialties are on the resin material side, um, so that's kind of the angle I'm gonna kind of go into this. Um, for this uh, uh, panel, um, and also uh, focus more on the uh, on the sub five thousand category. So uh, I'll I'll have to share some of my thoughts and what I see that might be interesting uh, for you. And if you have any question, you can also follow me out later at the uh, networking session. That's me, Leo. Excellent. Twenty sixteen times really flown by because um, we met shortly after you'd launched the company in Taiwan, I believe, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Yes. I, I think when we met, I only have one prototype. It was, uh, I was walking, but that was how I have. And I was, uh, I was riding a taxi, a taxi ride with uh, Michael in southern Taiwan. And that's how we met. Yes. That was it. Yes. Yeah. It was a great, great trip. Great conference there. Um, Nicholas, you're, um, you're a Polymaker. Maybe you could tell us um, where are you joining from today and uh, what, uh, what do you do with Polymaker, please? Sure. Uh, so first, I want to thank the 3D printing industry to uh, to uh, allow Polymaker to join this uh, this panel. I think it's, it's awesome to share um, 3D printing news and and 3D printing discussion with uh, with the community. So I'm Nick from Polymaker. Uh, I'm joining here from uh, from Shanghai, where uh, Polymaker is based. Polymaker is uh, is a company making uh, 3D filaments. So we are uh, we are more on the the polymer side and uh, FFF printing. So what I hope is uh, more knowledge on FFF or or FDM 3D printing on the material side, and we do have a lot of uh, partnership also uh, 3D printers. So I hope that I can also bring some some knowledge on the on the machine side. So I'm very looking forward to starting this uh, this discussion here also from uh, from the community on uh, on these topics. There's a few people in the chat saying um, how they miss Shanghai. Um, I can actually be counted amongst one of those. I remember um, certainly the food was amazing last time I was there, so I'd love to get back to Shanghai at some point. <laughs> and um, last but no, le no means least, we have Oliver Lee from Farsoon. Um, Farsoon, obviously a very well-known name. Um, Oliver, perhaps you could tell us a little bit about um, yourself and what you do at Farsoon, please. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Oliver Li. Uh, I'm here from Changsha, uh, where the headquarter of uh, Farsoon Technologies is. Uh, so Farsoon is a global company. Uh, we are focusing on powder bed fusion technology. So we make machines uh, both in plastic side and the metal side. So both plastic SLS and the metal MLS uh, technologies. And also, we are uh, a powder manufacturer, so we develop our own uh, nylon powder, uh, based nylon 12 based, for example. Uh, so, yeah, uh, we're very interested in uh, taking uh, in part of this uh, discussion with you guys. Hopefully, we can share some uh, very good opinions uh, from our uh, industrial um, uh, 3D printers uh, manufacturing point of view. So, yeah, very nice to meet, uh, meet you guys. Thank you, everybody, for joining. I think we've got a nice hopefully um, representative of a cross-section of the industry here. Um, we've got machines, materials, industrial, and um, and the small and little desktop systems. So I'm hoping between us we can get through everything. So let's get cracking on uh, first impressions of, um, of TCT uh, Asia. So Nicholas, I know, um, let's go to you first, because I saw some videos you were posting uh, last week 
maybe you could just give us your general impressions about, about the show and how was it to be back face to face with people? Yeah, so so the first thing is really the the, the, the amazing impression was just to get back on a on a hall full of uh, 3D printing experts, full of uh, technology related to additive manufacturing. That was that was the impression that I missed. Uh, the last exhibition was actually TCT last year, so it was a year um, of non-exhibition. Uh, you know, I'm someone that really loves uh, being in exhibition, seeing uh, all of technology things uh, because company usually takes uh, this opportunity to announce um, new technologies so uh, I like to attend this session. Yeah, I was really happy to see that uh, people were there uh, they were here to uh, to see the the, um, the evolution of additive manufacturing I really look at the numbers and and we had more attendees this year than last year uh, which, uh, which means that you know we, we're back on track um, unfortunately with the situation we had so I think we're we're back now and uh, definitely a lot of things to talk about today uh, that happened at, uh, at TCT so looking forward to share more more details on that Mark how was uh, how was uh, your show how did you find TCT the best show I've been to uh, in recent memories um, I, I was actually at Asia last year as well uh, last year, the five was really, you know, able to come out and meet some people and say, hey guys, I'm, I'm doing good. Uh, but this year is a little different. I think this year people come in with a lot of new ideas, uh, uh, the results coming from their research and development. Um, and I think 2020 was um, a record year in terms of sales for a lot of desktop level 3D printers. And so they do put in a lot of research and development into their product line. And this year it's like, showcasing what they have done so it has been a, it was a very exciting uh, uh, show for me I and mean, normally i stay on the floor for maybe a day four day and then kind of say okay i see everything but this year i was there for two and a half days and just you know keep talking to a lot of uh, <laughs> follow uh, 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 participants and that was a very exciting show i'm allowed to show you more yeah i think there's a real hunger for people to get back and uh really get because it, it's you know it's a growing industry it's a billion multi-billion dollar industry additive manufacturing but it really does feel like it's sometimes quite small it's a community and there's you know people want to make those connections and talk to each other um oliver how was um how was it for um how was tct asia for you oh it's great show. Uh, it's definitely a very good chance for us to meet again, again finally uh, uh, with this pandemic issue but i don't think it has too much impact in china so people still can uh, show up in shanghai and meet each other i see a very open industry here and it's growing dramatically in china you see more companies coming here and more friends and you see a lot of old faces but more like new faces because they are uh, more industrialized professional customers and uh, i see a lot of collaborations uh, you see machine suppliers making making bigger and bigger machine more and more continuous high quality production capability but also you can see like uh, post-processing uh, technologies like amt like uh, dimensions uh, like, like uh, materials uh, suppliers is also uh, you can see a lot of new players in china they're growing and uh, yeah I, I i can see a lot but you can see accessories so it's it's a combination but you see an open industry, you see a lot of collaborations. Well, in see people's eyes are still caught by uh, large machines, by industrialized uh, of additive manufacturing. Possibilities for the whole industry. So yeah, uh, overall it's great. Uh, it's great, yeah. Virginia, you were, um, you were in Munich, but you had your team on the ground out there. Um, what did about uh, about the show. As um, I just read a message, I'm in Shanghai. I must say, as Chinese, I really miss Shanghai. I haven't been in Shanghai now for more than one year, and uh, I was not able to go there. But uh, we have our reseller who is staging our booth. The feedback that um, it is a great show. Especially, we notice that the visitors, they are more educated. Mm. As, uh, as we were last, not 
two years ago, two years ago at TCT Shunton. The last time as we had a booth at TCT, we noticed that there are many visitors who are just, just asking, hey, what are you for? What are you doing? But now the situation this year is totally different. People come to our booth and then with a specific question, with a solution, uh, with, uh, with request for a solution, because they are thinking already about the production, which means it is not just print. It needs, if we think about production for 3D printed products, it is about design, print and finish. And the customers, the visitors already know this. This is a great jump for me, for Chinese a market that customers uh, understand AM industry mm. much better. Well, let, let's talk a bit more about that progression, actually, because that's interesting to hear. And um, I'd like to maybe at this point talk a bit more about um, the additive manufacturing industry within China and how it's progressing, how it's developing. Um, Oliver, what um, what do you see when you're um, when you're looking at the market? Um, how is the uh, how is the industry developing in the region? Yeah, um, I have been uh, staying with customer for about five years in the AM uh, industry. I, I traveled all over the world and uh, I, I installed machines even. So, like five years ago, it's totally a different picture here in China. And you, you, when you see the TCT show this year. I can see, as uh, Jing Yi said, is they are very well educated. I would say they are. They are, they even have more technology. They even have more knowledge in additive manufacturing than our manufacturers. They came here to teach us how you should make machine right to fit to our own industry to make us scale our production. This is this is one of the very big impression of uh, of me from TCT show. Uh, we are dragging by the customer compared with like two years ago and we, we try to show customer, hey, we can do this. Now it's totally different and we, we like this feeling. We like the feeling that the whole customer is coming towards us and ask us, hey, come help us finish this. It's, it's great. Yeah, it's definitely different. <laughs> great to hear when you know you have those, you're not having those entry level conversations. People are at a higher level, they know you know, they're not sort of can it do this? They go, well, well, will it do this now? And so they get more excited, I'm sure. Um, sure Mark, yeah. what, what's um, what, what's um, how do you see the industry? Because you're based in Shenzhen, so you're quite connected with everything that's going on. Yeah, um, I also do see um, a lot of the uh, uh, overall our, our segment of industry are moving more toward the more professional, um, and you see. Uh, even the value, like the low, lower cost desktop 3D printer makers, they, they start making more professional printers. And I think a good example you see at the show is uh, in Quebec, who have been making 200, 300 US dollar uh, uh, MSI based resin printer, which is amazing price. Um, but now they actually announced they're making DRP printers, which is clearly targeting to uh, uh, industrial users such as uh, dental applications or not. And I've seen at least five to six, uh, even just Chinese local OEMs. Um, you know, names will be Hey Gear, uh, Flashforge, and so on and so forth. Um, that they are making more, they are putting more investments into um, um, dental applications or production side resin printing. So this is clearly a trend for all of us, and also more specialized material as well. So speaking of materials, yes, Nicholas. Um, <laughs> How do um how are your customers? How are people coming to you for looking for solutions? How do you see the industry progressing from the polymaker perspective? Yeah, um, so I would say there's uh, there's two things that I, I've seen growing, uh, especially in China. The first one is the, uh, the uh, metal additive manufacturing. Um, I, I don't know if you remember, but at at next, I think it was 2019. And one massive hole was only um, while in China at uh, the same year at TCT, there is almost uh, no metal additive manufacturing. But this year, uh, it was almost easily maybe 50% of uh, the um, 
the, the, the presence we had at TC that were on, uh, on, on, on metal powder, uh, including uh, uh, Farsoon. And um, actually, I, I, I saw the, uh, the uh, eight laser from, uh, from Farsoon. There was very, it's developing so fast. Uh, this uh, this industry this uh, this particular technology in China. The second one is um, big area manufacturing, so BAM or MAM or SAM, depending on on, uh, on 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 the size. But that's another part that is developing very fast. And from the material side, uh, the uh, requirement are very different. Uh, so that force the uh, material company to develop filler uh, material for uh, FFF, but for a different technology. Um, and then I've seen uh, definitely um, uh, this from companies that are growing. So what I mean by that is that uh, you know, we have the consumer segment and the industrial segment that are growing very fast, creating a huge gap in the, uh, in the industry. Now, when you go to show, you have on one very consumer level uh, additive manufacturing related product. And just Next to it, you have this massive printer uh, for this uh, industry, and and it's very funny to see these these two part of the industry growing so fast. I, I won't, you know, I won't be surprised that at some point we'll have to have you know two different shows, one that is more focused on you know in use of additive manufacturing, and one more for a consumer level. So that I would say what, what I notice in uh, in the development of in, in China. Great. Um, so I'm glad to see people are using the uh, Q&A um, function to uh, ask questions to the panelists. Um, we're going to try to get to as many of those, but here's one um, from Howie Morotto, who I, which I think is quite relevant to this part of the conversation, at least. Um, and this will be open to all the panelists. So how much is AM penetrating traditional manufacturing industries, for example, automotive, aerospace shipbuilding in China, Asia at large? Um, and how do you see this uh, growing uh, in the future? I think, Oliver, that's probably a good one for you to um, to talk to. If that's, is that okay? Yeah, sorry. Uh, I, I, I was at uh, I was at meal, but uh, yeah, um, uh, that's a very good question. Um, we have working with a lot of customers for years. And um, I'm very excited to see like during past like two years, you see a lot of traditional technology has been transferred to uh, at a and uh, AM. Uh, for example, I think aerospace, automotive, medical, and the tooling probably is in my mind is at the top four, as well as, to, uh, as, well as service bureau, you can see a lot of uh, uh, technology. But the, when you see traditional, a lot of uh, parts made by traditional way in aerospace and automotive, now they are they are they are dramatically changed, which their design uh, mindset to a uh, to additive manufacturing. So yeah, this definitely uh, got changed uh, by additive manufacturing a lot. And also, uh, I think it's because of the the, the more freedom um, for designers to design lightweight uh, parts. So that's probably the cost I'm thinking. And also uh, by, uh, by the efforts of uh, man machine manufacturer, you can see the efficiency of the machine is, is growing uh, more and more. You see eight laser uh, system here in Farsun. And we are also have a very good volume, building volume. I see people also ask these questions. So this, this probably is, is also the reason to provide customers the, the possibility of uh, building the good size of the parts. Uh, with good size of machine, so yeah, this probably is a uh, industry in my mind has been impacted a lot. <laughs> All right, I'm, done. I'm doing it now. <laughs> yeah, I was saying, Jing, yeah, I'd like to ask you the same question because obviously. If you've only got one machine, you don't go to Dimension and buy a post-processing unit necessarily. It's once you start industrializing the technology and uh, people are using uh, AM at increased volume. So I'm wondering what your thoughts are about how um, traditional industries are now utilizing uh, additive in China. And for me, there are two sectors, two verticals, which are using uh, additive manufacturing. One is consumer goods, 
we have uh, um, we have shoe industry, and sector one is medical for orthotics, for example. And for the shoe industry, I think this time um, at TCT Asia, we have partner cross cross referencing with several partners. One partner um, is Siemens and EOS. Siemens, and I think the staging of Siemens is the indication of additive manufacturing is entering a uh, industrialization phase because Siemens is not printing, it's not designing, it's not doing finishing, but Siemens provides methods, tools, um, uh, which enables AM manufacturing to be industrialized, to be industry uh, 4.0 ready and as an example, as factory of the future, in this joint um, effort, Siemens, EOS, and Dimension, the example was a midsole, uh, which is made with a TPU. And for me, uh, especially with the material TPU, we notice that TPU is gaining more and more um, importance for the additive manufacturing for the shoes and you can do it also for medical and um, medical applications this is this is a thing we noticed at tct asia and i think um the point there you were saying about siemens eos and as i mentioned ties into uh, oliver's earlier point about collaboration and really sort of uh, needing it's not just one company who's going to sort of bring the industry up there. Okay, I see some um, more questions coming in, and the top one ties perfectly into the next uh, area for our conversation, which is to talk about um, the new machine technologies <clears throat> that um, were on show or were launched or um, generally sort of um, out in the wild uh, last week. So. Let's uh, let's talk about sort of machines, the 3D printers, the AM systems um, that were there. Um, Oliver, perhaps you could tell us a little bit to start off with. With um, so far soon, a lot of news from far soon. What's that? What were you announcing last week? Oh, yeah, a lot of news. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's 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 great time to 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 show people our new technologies. Uh, I think the first technology we highlight to uh, to customers is our uh, eight laser system. It's not only just a machine, but we are actually showing the technology, the multi-laser system. We have uh, been running double laser, dual laser, quad laser, eight laser system for both our powder bed technologies uh, in plastic and metal, uh, especially the metal machine we showed. So yeah, definitely number one is our uh, multi-laser uh, technologies. We can do uh, overlapping technology. We can also do the full bed. So, Flight technology, you have two laser systems, which can cover both. Both of them can cover the whole bat. So, yeah, it, it's there are a lot of different uh, details about this multi-laser system. But uh, yeah, we try to show people the possibilities of this, bring people higher efficiency, lower cost of parts. And second is also the the large volume, and not only for soon, mm. but you can see a lot of the companies showing the larger power bat fusion. Uh, the 3D printers, uh, the larger, the largest volume you can go reach, uh, even more than one meter tall part. Who was doing the one? Who, who, who was doing the one meter system? Oh, uh, actually, a lot. You, it's not only for soon, but also I, I see other Chinese competitors. They also have the uh, have a system. It be be able to print the, the parts like taller than one meter. Yeah, Farsun has the a laser system um, can build uh, seven hundred meter, which is on the show. But it, the machine didn't show, which is our six twenty one machine. It's six twenty by six twenty by one point two meter. Yeah, it's also our uh, our largest volume uh, machine tool now. So it's a so second is a large volume. Definitely, that's, the, that's polymers. Though we're talking about polymers here, not metals for that uh, that size. Well, yeah, uh, that size uh, we are talking about. Uh, we are talking about metal actually. Oh, the metal wow. machine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. First, we not only have uh, FS seven twenty one. First, we also have a six twenty one that has one point one point two meters tall uh, build chamber. So yeah. 
it's a uh, it's, it's large volume technology i would yeah. not like to be the engineer responsible for a failed build on that one <laughs> that's, that's an expensive mistake <laughs> yeah i can take one month build but if you equip with like a four laser system well your efficiency will be brain up dramatically so, uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> right and number three definitely is, uh, is our flight technology. You see, uh, based on our uh, flight technology, now we have dual laser system, which can bring the, uh, the efficiency of production uh, up to like a 50 or 90% higher than before, based on this uh, two laser system. This is specially designed for large volume uh, industrial customers to do the massive production with our system. We show the 403 system. Again, this is just technology to your dual laser system. We've already have a dual laser system equipped with our 1K machine, which has a, a one meter long uh, build chamber, which can also equip with this flight technology. So yeah, uh, for soon is uh, open technology. So when we show this technology, we, we, we mean that this technology can equip with different models of machines. And then the very last one is our collaboration with uh, material uh, companies. We are open platform, so not only uh, making powder by ourselves, we, all, we also work with Lima Vols, we work with BASF, uh, we work uh, with Ivani. Also, you can see we, we publish the new materials, like uh, new TPU materials with Lima Vols and the PP materials with BASF, and also other PA6-based material with Ivani. So yeah, all of this such new materials can bring customer more uh, possibilities for their production too yeah yeah a lot of good news but yeah <laughs> let's let's come back to the um to materials and um a bit later i think because um and certainly the polypropylene from bsf we we did speak a bit that about that at uh, our last uh event about um after AIM, the AMO conference but um jingyi maybe um what feedback did you hear about new um uh, technology platforms or uh, new machines in general at the show and um, yeah for us i would say uh, all the uh, not only in europe but also in china the sustainability regarding the environment regarding it, um to be climate neutral this is a new trend i think for me uh, for us uh, we have the new machine which is vapor fuse um, surfacing and this is a uh, sustainable one with no zero waste and uh, the solvent is eco solvent and for that technology we got eu um, grant i think for china especially with a high um, I do have contact with the high tech uh, innovation parks and they have always environmental assessment before installing uh, a 3D printing machine or 3D print, 3D um, post-processing machines. So I think the trend would be that um, the machines shall be also uh, sustainable. Okay. And, um our contribution of our vapor fuse surfacing machine. Um, Mark, um, how about yourself? Um, did you see any new um, any new machines on show? Any technologies, innovation? Um, well, I, I'm always focused on the resin side, so I see more of the, uh, the continuous uh, resin printing. Um, you know, carbon was there, of course, um, but I, I was very happy to visit the Nexus 3D uh, 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 their, their booth. Uh, I have heard so much about them. Um, in fact, I met their CTO in the past and, and finally get to see the printers up close. I think um, uh, in, uh, in previous uh, de um, developments, I think the continuous resin printing, which is basically you don't really have a layer, just keep pulling the resin printed the model up. Um, it, it's very fast, but you, you cannot print uh, model that has um, solid walls, like like solid pieces. Uh, and the reason for that is because if you have a very solid piece, the pure force is too much and you cannot do the continuous action. But what I've seen with uh, Nexus 3D and also um, I think Unis was working something similar to that is that you can now print complex structure that's actually solid, that's actually is difficult to print in the past. So I mm -hmm. thought that's a very exciting uh, another step forward in terms of moving uh, resin total production. 
Um, and so that that's the, the trend I've been seeing in uh, my industry. Um, also, I think um, for my segment of the industry, we um, a lot of our, our customers are um, they are you can it's they're not consumers, but they are not the big industry companies that you are you know we're usually familiar with. So these are the people with uh, maybe perhaps uh, uh, have a workshop, have a design shop, and some even run print shop in their garage to print for their Etsy shop. So these are entertainment, you can call them entertainment or cultural industries, but mm. they are actually the ones that have been driving a lot of the recent purchase of 3D printed materials. I think these are the, an important segment. And one exciting aspect about these users are that you can you could call them professional because they're actually uh, doing to um, make a profit, make a, uh, mm -hmm. sell their products. Uh, and another another aspect of this that they are they, they're not really bounded by any uh, previous uh, concept of 3D printing or what it could do. So they actually experiment a lot. Like they will mix different materials or resins. <laughs> um, sometimes the results not very good, but sometimes it's excellent. So I'm, I, I felt pretty excited to see this new crop of uh, users coming into our industry. And I think some of them will actually eventually uh, grow big and be, uh, becomes even more professional. So now they, they might stop getting SRS machines. They might start asking uh, post-processing products. So we see a lot of new entrants, new users mm -hmm. for our industry. And I think that's very exciting. You mentioned as well um, the trend towards um, DLP um, in more affordable machines as well. And certainly we're seeing a fair bit of news about now 4K systems, uh, 8K systems, uh, 6K systems. <laughs> you know, so, some of this is, um, is maybe a little bit of marketing speak, but um, I, um, I, what are your thoughts about, um, about this and the, the, the speed, the resolution, quality? I think the, the obviously I think it's it's kind of like um, a few years ago with camera where people talk about how much megapixels your camera can pack in, and I think we're close to a, a area where uh, it's starting to max out. Um, but it does help a lot. I think um, when people wanted to do resin printing over other options, the number one thing they want to see is resolution. Like they want to see mm. um, very high resolution. Uh, sometimes uh, too much ex expectation of resolution because uh, resolution can, you know, reveal the faults in your uh, model, and you actually might spend more time in post processing. Um, but I think that's a, a that's a good development. I do think that's starting to hit um, a, a bit of a limitation, and I think um, uh, a lot of uh, OEMs are start thinking about other aspects uh, of the printing, like faster speed better service finish, so less uh, less post-processing, and also uh, temperature control. Uh, uh, things area like this that will improve printing results because resolution is not, uh, not the only factor about getting a good print. Mm -hmm. um, okay, good. Um, Nicholas, we're going to get to the materials um, discussion in a bit, but just whilst we're talking about um, uh, machines and technology platforms, um, anything which caught your eye? Um, and caught my eyes except the eight lasers machine from first one. Uh, it's hard to say, but I, yeah, um, in terms of uh, on the FFF side, a new machine, uh, for example, the new machine from uh, from Ray CD that that is uh, going to uh, to metal now, uh, the Intemsis uh, FFF machine for a uh, high temperature material. That, that Ray's new, machine is not, that is that using um, you say. The rays are doing a metal machine. Is that um, a filament that's in, got particles embedded, or? Yeah, correct. Uh, so mm -hmm. it's a filament that has, um, you know, metal powder, and then you need to sinter the part towards yes. yeah. uh, to get that uh, that metal part. So uh, it was surprising uh, to see a uh, ray 3 d broaden their their the spectrum spectrum of um, of machines. So new technology. Itself, I, I haven't seen uh, much except on the the metal printing, uh, the SLM, the, uh, the the laser melting. On the F, was more in, in terms of new technology in uh, in a big area um, additive manufacturing. 
where we had great innovation uh, when it comes to the uh, the extruder. So how to how to manage uh, the pressure uh, when you print with uh, with pellets. Uh, but in terms of uh, new machine, I would say I have more seen technology I had before, but better done and mm. much cheaper. So uh, you know, DLP was there before, SA was there before, but now we have all of this technology, and China able to make technology with much greater accuracy and uh, for a very very low cost that hasn't been seen before. I think that was the thing that impacted me more the most. Uh, rather than an actual new mm -hmm. innovative technology as the, uh, in the FFF industry. You mentioned, um, or you were about to mention before I interrupted you, but Intimsys, um, who are another great local company. Yes. Yeah. Sorry, um, it, it was a little bit... Uh, yes, you, um, well, yes, what are, what, yes, sure. What are, what are Intimsys doing? Um, you were about to say something about them before I interrupted. Yes, uh, so actually, uh, so we, we released news just before TNT about our uh, recycling carbonates uh, in partnership with restaurant. So, uh, Intimacy, uh, why we partner with them? Because they, you know, there's two ways to uh, develop the FFF uh, in terms of what material you can use. It's either you make a material and then you, you try to develop a printer that can print this material. Or you have a printer and they try to develop the materials that can print well on this printer. And the good thing of having a good relationship with printer manufacturers is we can develop at the same time. So how Intimacy really helped us on, on this was that we had a new uh, possibility of creating recycled polycarbonate thanks to a new uh, recycled PC from Covestro. And then we took it in and, and we really tried to work on the printability of this material. Uh, but we had to have um, and a more um, a better machine to print this. We're talking about a higher uh, chamber temperature. We're, we're talking about higher extrusion temperature. Uh, we went we we went to Intimacy and we asked them, you know, whether they had printers or, or they had the technology that could allow to to print this uh, this material. And uh, actually, at this TCT, they they presented their uh, full, full mat HD. I think that's how it's called. Mm -hmm. And uh, which which allowed I think 500 degree on the on the nozzle, 140 plus on on the chamber, which allowed a wide range of material to print very reliably. Mm, good, good. Um, a couple of things I, I've I, I noticed um, from videos and on social media. Um, one was a company um, called HBD, who I don't know much about to be honest with you, but they were talking about. Um, a very uh, large um, volume uh, metal printing system. Um, and the other thing I noticed was um, a KUKA robot arm with um, a print head mounted onto it, which was um, um, not dissimilar to um, a project um, that I think Stratasys launched INTS in 2016, the continuous composite printer. Um, but unlike that, um, Stratasys uh, project. Um, this was just printing. Um, it, the the bed wasn't moving. The Stratasys one is actually a six axis, uh, seven axis uh, sort of system, whereas this uh, particular one um, was just sort of printing something which is not uh, not as complex. Um, anyway, let's let's jump into the materials, um, which um, I know. Um, Nicholas, you'll be eager to talk about. So let's come straight back to you, and then we'll come to you, Jing, Jingyi, next on the materials. Yeah, yeah, sure. So um, I, I think I just uh, just talked about sustainability, and and I think that's come on the on field too. Um, you know, Polymaker has released um, this year the uh, Polytherapy LA, which is more uh, consumer based, and what we're trying to do is. To develop more sustainable materials, and uh, the other one, uh, the more on the uh, industrial side, was uh, the uh, the uh, polycarbonate um, uh, in, in partnership with Covestro. So, what was the difficulties behind is that we want to go into producing recycled materials. Uh, we have the issue of how to control the quality and how to control the sourcing of the recycled materials. So, the great thing about partnering with with Covestro is they are actually 
uh, you know, the supplier of um, uh, a company in, uh, in, 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 in China producing big bottles of uh, polycarbonate. So they have uh, full control on the end of life of this product that is going back to them cycle. So we have been able to partner with them in order to create uh, uh, a polycarbonate filament uh, that has great properties uh, it's on modulus or whether it's on the thickness of the filaments and the printability when it's uh, with, uh, with, uh, with a great printer such as the, uh, the industry. So we have 50% of the this material that is coming straight from uh, recycled uh, bottles. You know, um, being environment friendly uh, product and I think uh, sustainability is is a big topic only in our industry, actually, but uh, but in, in in industries, I think there's a lot to do on the material side. Uh, whether it's a more consumer side, creating, uh, like I say, our polytherapy LA and creating you know packaging around that is more sustainable, the product itself that can have a better end of life, or even on the industrial side where we can try to create. It's not because it's recycled. That it means that it won't perform, and I think all of this will only come from great partnership between uh, uh, suppliers uh, of materials, uh, printers, and also um, the uh, the uh, recycling industry. For example, you know we hear a lot of, at least in the FFF industry, about PLA, PLA being uh, an eco-friendly materials. But if we don't have, if we don't make the effort of partnering with recycling uh, facilities or compostable facilities to understand from their point of view how you know they receive all of these printed parts uh, because right now when you produce PLA parts uh, that is actually you know highly used in prepping even though it's you know PLA considered as a consumer materials but it's actually one of the main material used still for uh, prototyping and all of this while we think that it's Material will actually end up on landfill, etc. So, on the material side, I think uh, this year we we are uh, starting to see more and more uh, more eco-friendly materials, or see process that want to develop materials towards this uh, eco-friendliness. Jingyi, how are you? Um, what sort of impression did you get of? Um... Uh, the materials conversation or whether there were new materials launched uh, during the show. Anything uh, you can add to this? Yeah, first I would say I totally agree with Nicholas on uh, recycling of materials. Um, but before I forget that, I would say for us, TPU, as I mentioned, um, first, Dayfoss and Farsun, with Farsun's flight and technology, they have a new material, TPU material, which is finished by our, uh, which is finishable with our technology. And the same with Wanghua, the same with the BASF. And um, because we are almost at the last end of the whole process chain, um, I think people have already understand, understood that if I'm designing, um, the part shall be printable. But if I'm, if I'm printing, if, I design, if I'm doing the material, it should be finishable. I think this concept is already prevailing through all the industry, which is good. And second to uh, Nicholas' um, sustainability um, topic, to materials. I think, um, yeah, as Oliver has mentioned, customers are driving us because 3D printing is per se not so cheap. It is still a new a, a elite technology. In order uh, to get 3D printing technology, to be established uh, the same as traditional technology. First, 3D printing needs to provide constantly highest quality at the same and, and at the same time priced competitively as the um, pr pr traditional technology. So the powder is a big cost factor. 
and if I'm think if, if I'm thinking about powder bed, um, the material, I mean, if I'm thinking about powder bed fusion technology, um, the whole chamber, and uh, uh, if the part coming out of it, it is a cake. Good, a good portion of the powder get lost. So people are always checking, hey, refresh rate shall be higher, higher, higher. But I think there will be new technologies developed that the powder handling um, will be more efficient without, without sacrificing the quality. This will be, uh, um, yeah, there will be new technologies coming. Some, it's something we do see at, um, at shows or in, in videos is how to actually, you know, really optimize the machines when, when especially you've got that cooling factor to consider when it comes to um, comes to some of these technologies and how to actually remove cool and uh, really sort of process these in an efficient manner and get that all important reusability as well. So Oliver, let's let's t come to you now on the materials. So. Um, Jeannie mentioned the TPU, and you were telling us a little bit about um, the polypropylene um, from BASF. Um, maybe you could tell us a bit more about, um, about those and any other materials you'd like to talk about. Oh, sure. Yeah, as uh, Jeannie said, customer is driving us. So uh, I think for machine manufacturer and as well as a powder manufacturer. We work closely with a lot of different material manufacturers globally. The reason is I think we are always limited. The market is so big and we need more partners coming together playing with us. So say TPU is always a widely used material, but uh, nobody has tried in our flight technology. Flight technology brought us uh, almost double the, 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 the printing speed of the SLS printer. But uh, we don't have too much material to, to play with. And luckily we, we finished the work with uh, Lehman Bowles. And uh, to, to finish this uh, gray color uh, flight material, we call it uh, X92A slash 1064. Um, and uh, thanks to like dimensions, it's post-processing. Uh, companies to make it make all the parts look so perfectly and we show a lot of parts. I see a lot of customers love it. So it's definitely a successful collaboration with uh, Lehman Bowles. And we have been working with Lehman Bowles since with white TPU materials. And now we have new technologies and this collaboration going deeper and we're moving to the next stage to build the flight material. So I, as you can see, when you work with different partners and you go longer and longer, you have more and more possibilities. This is what I got. Same for BASF. BASF is also Farsun's old partner. We started with uh, PA6 development work since like five years ago. And uh, now uh, with poly uh, polypropylene uh, getting more and more pop popular in the 3D printing industry, the same, the, the information is from customer. Like a couple of years ago, customers started asking, can you print this? and we have this massive uh, production needs. And so we said, okay, yeah, we are open. We always want to help you, but to, not, not by ourselves. We want to work with BSF. And, uh, and because we have same trend, we have same, uh, um, we have old, uh, old uh, collaboration method, makes this very high efficiency. You can see we, we can kind of shorten our uh, development uh, time period to bring this PP material to market as quick as we can. So with this collaboration, you can go deeper, you can move into the next stage together with the machine printing technology. Also, you can make your uh, development uh, efficiency higher and higher. Yeah, always be open. I think it's good. Hey, Oliver, maybe I have a quick question, if, if, if that's okay. You are- Sure. You guys have a, a great portfolio of material now. And uh, I was wondering, do you think with this portfolio of materials, you are able to you know, answer most men of your customers? Or do you feel that you still need a, a wide variety of, uh, of material just to you know, hope to, uh, to answer this demand? Or do you think with the portfolio you have now, you, you're already you know, able to, uh, to, to cover most of the education? 
Oh, oh, thanks, Nicholas. That's a very, a very good question. Actually, no. The answer is definitely no. We we feel we feel still high pressure. We still feel we cannot fulfill our customers' request at all, and they are always uh, giving us new tasks. And our R and D team is working day and night to fulfill, no matter in metal side, but also in plastic side. It's always you can see you only take like a, a, a one percent of this market. We see very huge potential. So that is why we don't work as alone. We always want to work with all the material manufacturers to develop more uh, additive uh, powders. So yeah, definitely we need more work. We need to work harder for sure. <laughs> so that's a great answer. I hope that answered your question, Nicholas. Um, we've um, not talked about one other class of materials today, which is ceramics. Uh, and there's a question coming from Karen Linda. Um, maybe Mark, if maybe if you could take this one. Where, did you see any ceramic materials? I did. Um, there's actually uh, this. Yes, I think there's the one that's uh, excluded. So it's kind of like a DM printer, but instead of filaments, you have the uh, like uh, uh, a very thick piece of uh, ceramic. Uh, those has been around for a while, um, and there's always one or two uh, OEMs at, uh, at the show. And this year, no different. One well, is actually a good friend of mine, my from Fujian, and I see the technology has improved quite a bit. It's not for all industries, uh, but for the right industries. Like I think he was, you know, Fujian is known for tea, so a lot of his products actually going for specialized uh, ceramic for teas. So he's doing very well, and he's also making a lot of furniture with it. So I, I see that, that. And then there's also obviously the uh, um, you know, like a ceramic paste kind of uh, printing. Uh, I think there's a lot of them. Um, there's like two or three companies coming from Europe for that. Um, um, and then there's also on the resin side, there's ceramic resins that's being uh, developed. Those are, I think, still needs a year or two before it's being mature because um, those resin needs to be sinister, and when you do that, it shrinks a lot, and it's a bit difficult to print and predict the uh, the accuracy of the the results. So I think there still needs some work, but there's a lot of uh, uh, um, um, uh, application kind of waiting to be developed in that area. Okay, well that actually links nicely into the next part of the conversation, which is around software. And um, you were talking about um, that multi-stage process when you're working with um, sintering um, a part, whether it's ceramic or whether it's um, um, a metal component that needs a secondary sintering process, something here like the desktop metal process, for example. And that predictability um, and how to actually gauge that. Obviously, there's a software um, application sort of behind that and how to do that. So that's my very rambling way of introducing Let's see what uh, what software developments we saw um, during uh, last week. Were there any, um, or was this not something that was um, massively on on uh, display? Who would like to tackle the software question? Um, yeah, maybe I can bring a few a few software. Yes. yes. That are, that are, uh, uh, so again, maybe more on the uh, on the FFF part. So. Um, Definitely one. Uh, so on the FFF part, I think there's a, a lot that has been done on the uh, on the ISO side. Uh, so you know the the tool that is used to transform this model to uh, to do to to, to to your printer. And uh, and I think I, I really like what Race 3D did with their uh, with their slicer. You know, like a, a very. Uh, so what they did is uh, they had the new features that they presented at TCT, where you can add feature to your prints. Um, and I think. So first, uh, on the software side, I think it's very hard to do on there. Um, uh, so their slicer is called Idea Maker, and um, and the way they did it is uh, very smart. So now it's a very easy to use tool, and it brings much more than only you know just adding texture. But you can you can use the texture to make end products. So what this software is telling us is that you know more and more parts are used for as an end use part. And um, so actually in our customer base, we have a large portion that are used for materials to print parts that they are going to sell. Uh, so they do need this part to look good. So I'm, um, you know, post-processing, uh, Jeannie talked a lot about post-processing, I think is more 
more important because 3D printing is now used uh, more and more in use parts. And uh, so that, that's uh, one, one of the software. The other one is um, uh, simulation. They, they were not at TCT, but they were through uh, the partner. And data simulation is basically trying to simulate your, uh, your part strengths uh, directly from the slicer and trying to modify your slicer setting. And what gives us is it makes the process much smoother rather than printing, testing, printing, testing part. Uh, they allow us to, uh, they allow the customers to test their part uh, via um, uh, um, finite elements uh, and then uh, allow you to print one maximum times your part, which save a lot of, uh, a lot of cost, even more. You know, you save costs just by using 3D printing, uh, but you can save uh, you can save even more uh, with their software. So I think that's the two one uh, that uh, that I think I had, or at least I saw at uh, Thanks. Does anybody anyone else like to uh, chime in on the topic of software? Now, Nicholas mentioned it. I, I saw an topology and also. Uh, uh, Mark Forge. Well, Mark Forge is an old hardware OEM. It's software. It's uh, uh, top notch. And I think uh, the trend I like to see. I'm actually working on a project myself too. Is to see uh, more artificial intelligence kind of stuff being applied to uh, uh, 3D printing, especially in uh, for detection. I think uh, printing kind of you know see some perhaps there's some problems with the print and start adjusting. Uh, the print settings and hardware is on the fly. I think that would be an amazing feature. I believe that's been done in a lot of higher-end industry printers. Mm -hmm. But I do see that coming down as well. But that's one thing we, we like to work on for the resin printer too. Uh, it is, um, you know, you put a printing, you just wait until, you know, 20 hours later and see if it works or not. And if this files you try to repair, that's how most of my users do. But I think there's a better way to do that. Great. Um, look, I realize we're getting towards the end of the hour here, and it's a long time just to stare at a screen without interacting. So we're going to get to networking in a bit. Just two final questions um, from the audience. I'd like to sort of see if anyone can tackle this. So um, my favorite reason for going to a trade show is obviously you know, talking to the people and getting behind the press releases and if part of that is maybe what you might call gossip. So uh, <laughs> here's, here's a question which could possibly fall into that category. Um, so the mysterious person here is asking, any big M&A deals in AM coming in Asia and China in particular? Now, if they don't have any information like that, they'd like to share so we can all get rich. No, I think that, that one was never going to really get an answer there. And um, <laughs> we've also um, seen me afterwards with some stock tips. Um, <laughs> no, don't actually. I'm not good financial advice. Um, okay, and another question here, which is um, sort of, I suppose, geographically, it's it's close. So um, we have a question from Ardesh uh, Govind, who's asking, how do you see the market in the future of AM in India with um, FDM, SLS, and Metal 3 dp um, particularly with great companies like Farsoon lodged in India? So um, I think Oliver Singh is uh, your name in that one. Maybe you could uh, see, see, give us your perspective on, you know, very quickly <laughs> on another market. Okay. Yeah, great. yeah. Thanks, uh, thanks, put Farsoon's name here in the question. Yeah. Um, I see, I see good potential because we have been working with uh, Indian collaborators since uh, several years ago, I say uh, three years ago. But yeah, we have been contacting uh, Indian customers uh, all way along till now. We, 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 we joined some uh, trade shows yeah, we even brought machines there. So we see a lot of uh, very uh, potential customers there and a very good market uh, for both SLS technology and SLM, uh, Powder Bad Fusion technology. So yeah, and we do have some collaborators already. And if you guys are interested in, please search and uh, reach out to our partners and they can help you get in, in contact with Farsoon. Definitely for other technologies, FDM and uh, uh, 3DP, yeah, for sure. I think India is a big market, as big as China. Yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, we do have quite a big readership in India. So obviously it's a growing market and a lot of people keen to, uh, to know more. And I think maybe that's, um, that's an idea that for later, maybe it's time to do a 3D printing debrief 
uh, with some Indian uh, companies and some representatives from that region. Okay, so um, just for now, um, I'd just like to say thank you um, very much to Jing Yi, to Mark, to Nicholas, and to Oliver for um, giving up your time. I know it's getting pretty late in some parts of the world, so I really do appreciate you taking time uh, out of your day or or night even to join us and um, share your uh, your knowledge and uh, insights from the show. Um, just one final thing before we go to the networking, there will be um, another 3D printing industry event on June the 17th. Um, this time the topic will be regenerative medicine. And if you'd like to attend that one, then I'll just post a link there in the chat. Um, for now, panelists, thank you very much and great to see you all. Um, hopefully see a few of you in the networking session now. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Goodbye, everyone. Bye. Bye for now.